Mm -hmm. Just we'll give it a couple more minutes. If not, we can get started. All right, all right, let's get started. All right, so this meeting is, is being recorded. It's going to get posted onto the uh, the Guac YouTube channel, um, as well as the, well, not the Linux Foundation anymore because in this case, but at least the Guac YouTube channel will have the recorded version. Um, so this is an open SSF meeting, so it's subject to the code of conduct, as well as the Linux Foundation antitrust policy. Oh, right, there's Ben. Awesome. Um, just getting started, Ben. Uh, so yeah, the open SSF link is broken for whatever reason. So I think I'll have to talk to them, but this meeting is being recorded and we can post this on YouTube. And I just went through the code of conduct and the, the antitrust policy. All right. Um, I think I recognize everybody's name here this week. I don't see anybody that's new. So uh, welcome everyone. Um, I did want to give a couple of updates um, on you know community stats. I'm trying to put together like some dashboards and stuff from there's a couple of different services that provide it. Um, we do have uh, uh, LFX insights, so the Linux Foundation's metric service um, now includes Guac under the OpenSSF. Um, and so you should be able to see your contributions there if you log into LFX um, and see stats. Um, but we did have six first-time contributors in the last quarter um, and two contributor ladder promotions. Um, one of the things that I was really glad to see was um, just in the one month that we've made the maintainers meeting uh, public, so those weekly Monday meetings, um, we've had seven people who aren't maintainers join those um, representing five different affiliations. So that's really awesome to see that, uh, you know, the community is interested in participating in those discussions and you know keeping up with what the maintainers are coordinating in those meetings um, and again like those are also published uh, to youtube uh, with notes in the governance repo as well um, and so for this quarter i'd like to kind of keep up that that same trend i'd love to get um you know six more first-time contributors one of the things that i personally am going to be focusing on is trying to build up and improve our documentation on docs.guac.sh. Um, and so I'll put some effort into finding some documentation contributors in particular. Um, but of course, you know, if there are bug fixes or features or anything that you'd like to add to the website or to the code, um, we do um, you know, definitely welcome those. Uh, and to answer the, there's a question in chat, um, is the, um, maintainer meeting on the OpenSSF calendar, yes. Um, those are, it's on the same calendar, so it's OpenSSF.org slash get involved. Um, I usually try and post reminders on Mondays before the meetings. Uh, meetings take place, I think, what, at 11 a.m. Eastern? Um, and so I usually, if I'm around and remember, I will post a reminder about an hour beforehand um, just with the link to that week's Zoom meeting. Um, but those are, you know, definitely open to the entire community to to join in and you know hear what's going on and, and you know, offer input where where appropriate. Uh, so yeah, um, so I'd also like to have uh, two contributor ladder promotions again. Um, I think you know be, because we've now expanded the contributor ladder to include uh, documentation as a uh, an area of expertise as well as the website. Um, I think that's a, an achievable goal. Um, so hopefully some of those six first time contributors from Q2 will you know move up the ladder. Um, and then my other you know goal for this quarter is to try and find like a major company or FOSS project to be a reference user for Guac 
So, you know, somebody who will come on board, um, you know, help us fix, you know, rough edges around the project and then, you know, tell everyone what an awesome tool Guac is. Um, and so if you or someone you know um, represents a company or a, you know, a major open source project, that would be a good fit. Um, you know, let's definitely talk about that in Slack or on the mailing list. Um, as a reminder of the mailing on the mailing list, um, we are moving those off of Google Groups to uh, the Linux found the OpenSSF's list server. Uh, there haven't been a lot of people who have actively signed up. Um, you know, fractions of a percent, I think, of the original uh, Google Group size. So my question, and so, something we should probably discuss, um, you know, offline or you know asynchronously as well is do we want to just mass subscribe people um, or maybe you know maybe we say well the mailing list isn't actually that useful for our project um, so if anybody has initial thoughts on those questions you know we could I think we have time today to talk about them um, and it's definitely something we can talk about more um, over the next few weeks Yeah, I mean the it the mailing list has only been used for just giving updates, you know, release updates as well as community meeting, um, yeah, you know, notifications. There's not haven't been really not a lot of chatter on it. So if it's not really needed, like uh, I'm not opposed to removing it if it's one less thing to manage. It seems like a lot of people either use Slack to communicate, um, or or you know have some kind of a or in the community or you know the community meetings the maintainer meetings or the guac time calls usually is when most of the communication happens yeah and i, I didn't publish a blog post um about this community meetings agenda because i um ended up being out on tuesday and um feeling sick on wednesday but um you know it's another avenue for you know, making some of those announcements and now that there's an rss feed available um, you know, maybe that just makes the the mailing list just unnecessary. Um, okay, so you know, we'll we'll continue to have that discussion, and maybe I'll you know make a poll and share it in Slack and the mailing lists, and one see when people respond, and uh, to see what the community's consensus is there. Um, so I also had a couple updates on work I've done on web and related things. Um, so let me share my screen real quick. I just wanted to kind of show this off. Um, so I did have made some improvements to the uh, the community page. Just includes more of you know links to the calendars and meeting notes and recordings. Uh, but the big thing I wanted to show off is the Why Guac page. Um, so that kind of takes some of the messaging um, that was on the front page and some stuff that just had kind of existed in everyone's minds but hadn't been written down. Um, and that, you know, kind of, I hope is a good representation of like what the Guac project aims to be and why people might be interested in using it. Um, it's linked across the top banner on the Guac site. Um, and I come, you know, kind of use cases in a couple of different buckets. Um, I would love feedback and suggestions for improvement. Um, you know, you can uh, drop me a message in Slack or, you know, open up a, a pull request on the Guac landing repo. Um, but I think, you know, hopefully this kind of gives away when, you know, as we're talking to people about the project, hey, here's a, an easy link to kind of explain what it is we're trying to get at. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to uh, show off is a very small thing that I've done, um, but the uh, SBOM Everywhere SIG in the OpenSSF has a catalog, uh, so it's sort sortable. You can group it based on licenses, um, standard, the, the standards that are supported, the different uh, abilities, 
um, but you can see that guac is now added to that searchable catalog um, just some basic information about it and um, thanks to Brandon Lum for jumping in and adding a, another capability that I had neglected to include in the initial request um, so that's just another way for people to you know, find out about the project and learn a little bit more um, with a you know, link to the site so they can learn even more. Uh, and so that that was all I had for for my updates. Um, if there are any questions or comments on that before we'll hand it off to the maintainers. All right, so uh, Parth, what are the maintainers working on? You're muted. Yep. Uh, yeah, so let me share my screen. So I'll, I'll run through a couple of things. Um, so the first one is going to be, you know, we added the ability to ingest vulnerabilities um, or query for vulnerabilities on ingestion. Um, basically, this, some of this, the certifier, you know, because it, it runs in an interval, right? It's not going to give you an instantaneous vulnerability response. So, you know, if that is something that's necessary, like, hey, I want vulnerabilities, right? As I ingest the S bomb, now you have the capability of doing that. So, what's going to happen now is that when ingestion actually occurs, um, so when it parses out some of the packages and so forth, it's going to automatically query OSV, it's going to pull the vulnerabilities in. And it's going to be part of the graph right away. So when you query for the S bomb, you'll have the have the the license or the vulnerability information right then and there for you. And this is configurable. So if you don't want this feature, um, then you can just disable it uh, during the ingestion time. Um, at the same time, the certifier will still run. So this is not replacing the certifier. What this what basically it's happening is, right? You want instantaneous vulnerability uh, from your S bomb. But at the same time, the certifier should be running, you know, daily, whatever kind of frequency you want it to run at. So it's, you know, continuously checking every day or every couple of days to see if there's new vulnerabilities in your environment that you should be worried about, right? And then, and then, um, and then, uh, you know, cascading all that information back up to you, kind of thing. So this is more of an immediate response for vulnerabilities uh, as you're kind of ingesting. So that's one thing. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, show that off. It's basically just, um, it's just a flag. Uh, so here, uh, share my terminal here. Um, so on ingest, we can change this to bones. I think it's bone. I forget the exact command. I think that's it. Um, so I'm just ingesting, I'm just ingesting one document right now, but you can do this for all of them. Um, and then it finished. So you can, if I scroll up to certify bone, you can see there's 131 got ingested. And there should be some vulnerabilities also that came in through it. So, you know, so now if I, and I'll jump to the, the playground a little bit later, but like now if I, if you query the, you know, the playground, you can see that the vulnerabilities are, are, are already there without running the certifier. So that's one. Um, and then the other one, again, I'll do, do it at the, uh, I'll jump, when I jump over to the playground, I can show this off. A lot of people, um, a, lot, a lot of users actually have been asking about the ability to delete uh, specific nodes from the uh, from the um, from the graph basically right but let's say you know if, if it was a mistake or you know it was a, some test data that got added in there let can we delete some of this information so that that was a that was a request that I that I got a lot uh, often so we enabled the ability to delete three nodes so we can you can delete has s bomb nodes which in turn will also delete all the dependencies and occurrences that are part of it um, there is, it also, we have the ability to delete has salsa and finally certify vulnerability because, uh, right. Those can, again, you could have a lot of old, old trailing certified vulnerabilities, uh, sitting around in the graph that are not really necessary anymore. Right. So you can just go delete them out. So you can probably have like a, you know, like a job running. I'd be like, that just says like, Hey, you know, delete all the last, last, uh, anything that's older than one week delete all the certified vulnerabilities, right? Because you don't need them anymore because you have the most up-to-date ones because the certifier, again, should be running every day or whatever frequency you want it to run at. Um, so it doesn't delete any nouns, right? So nouns are like packages, artifacts, um, a source builder, all that kind of stuff, right? So it's not gonna delete any of those because they could be used for other relationships, right? Um, so this is just deleting 
the right the now the node itself in this case you know for example has s bomb the node itself but as well as the, the occurrence and dependencies because those are specific to that has bomb right um and then the last thing i'm going to talk about is the just today i finished the integration with the clearly defined and i can show off a quick demo for that um, again, that we have the, you have the ability, again, that runs as a certifier because the way clearly defined runs is that, uh, if you carry for a specific package, right, um, a license for a specific package and it doesn't know it, it clearly defined itself will kind of go out and look for information on that package. So the next time you query for it again, it will be there, right? It may or may not be there, right? If it finds information, it's going to populate it for you. So, uh, that's the reason. So. That's why it runs as a certifier because it's it's not like a one-time scan. So you want to continuously scan. Again, you can set the frequency, you know, you can make it per week, for example, like, hey, let's check again the next day or next week to see if there's new license information that maybe you can pull in. Um, so it's it's gonna pull the license information in for you. So there's, there's, there's three different avenues for license information, or sorry, two, right? So is this gonna be coming from the SBOM directly or it's gonna come from the clearly defined, which, which gives you, um, you know, which is a database that's got like a curated and all that kind of stuff and more information is always being added, right? So you're always getting more up-to-date information. And that gives you information on a package as well as source. So if it has source related license information, it's going to pull that in also along with it. Um, similarly to the vulnerabilities, you can have it do it on ingestion. So if you're like, hey, I want license information right right now um, for a specific SBOM, right? It maybe doesn't include it or it does, whatever it is. I want to pull it in, you know, I want to query clearly defined for whatever information it has. So you can do so again. Uh, that's going to be a similar, so I can, I can just, oops, uh, again, you can just change this to license now. Uh, and then if I run this again, it's going to ingest the same document again, but you can see it's querying, uh, right now I have this info coming out, info law coming out saying like, Hey, it, it couldn't find a specific license definition. Um, I'll change this to debug. This is just, just some logs getting, getting pulled out right now. Just to show you what it found and what it didn't find. Uh, some of these things are, a lot of them are source information that it's not finding. It's trying, like it's, you know, it's specified, but it's not, it's not actually there. Uh, but a lot of the package information looks like it got found. So if I, if you look at this now again, uh, so, you know, so you can see certified legal, there's 100 and, 194 got pulled in and licenses, you know, there's 69 different licenses that got pulled in in this one, one different thing. Um, and again, you can run this as a certifier also, which is going to do something similar. So ingestion, like you saw, right? Ingestion is slower if you include all these things, right? Because now you're waiting on the API to respond to you, uh, versus right. Everything is just, everything's just happening locally in your environment. So, you know, it's a lot quicker to ingest when you're just ingesting, ingesting some data. Otherwise, if you're trying to query out to OSD or clearly defined, it's going to add some latency to your ingestion. So. Beware, there's some, some trade-offs, right? Uh, but again, at, at the end of the day, so the certifier is going to run, right? So it's, it's always going to give you some, it's going to give you that information sooner rather than later, right? So if, you, if you're okay, okay, okay waiting, then you can just wait for it. All right. Any questions before I move on? All right. So let's take a look at the... Um, right, so I have it here. So what I'm doing is I'm just querying for uh, all the certified legals that are coming from clearly defined as a collector, right? So you can see here, um, this specific one is a source information. It, you know, it shows you what the license is. And there are two different things, right? There's a discovered license versus uh, a declared license. In this case, um, clearly defined was giving us a discovered license. So it gives us that information as well as some attributions around it, like where did it come from and so forth. Uh, and then of course, justifications that it came from this location. Uh, so that's a, that's a source. There should be some packages, one packages in here also. Uh, so if I, like, for example, I, I know log for J is in here because this is my, one of the images that I created that contains log for J. Yes, you can see the subject log for J. And down here, you can see the license. There is a declare license of it, uh, to, uh, Apache and then uh, and then it's listing out the actual licenses and then the discovered license is also Apache 2.0 and so forth. So all this information is gonna get continuously pulled in, right? So there's, like I said, the package doesn't contain 
uh, a license today, clearly find may go out and find more information about it. And then maybe tomorrow it does have this information. So the, the certifier will pick up on it and re-ingest and give you this, give you new information as that comes, comes up. Um, so that's that piece. Uh, and then I think vulnerabilities, right? We ran the one, we ran vulns. So I should be able to see, right? The, all the vulnerabilities that came from, uh, I did it from Ortiz. As we look for Jay's in there. Uh, question? Yeah, everyone, go ahead. Uh, I, you can wait after you're done showing this. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so that's licenses, uh, ingest vulnerabilities on, um, on ingestion, and then the delete functionality. So, for example, here, right, I have this big S bomb. Right, that's the one I just ingested. You can see this is the our uh, my vuln image, which contains like log for J and text for shell, all that kind of stuff. So what I want to do is like, hey, I want to delete this, right? Because I know this is just test data, right? So I'm gonna take the ID and come down here. It is a new delete uh, functionality. So you just pass in the ID of the of the uh, the node you want to delete. So in this case, um, I want to delete the has S bomb. So it, like I said, it doesn't work for everything. It only works for has S bomb, has salsa, and certified vuln, certified vuln. It does not work for other things at this point, right? If there's a use case for it, then we can definitely include it. But so if I run this, it's gonna it's gonna go in and delete. It's gonna return a true. So what happened in the background? Like I said, it's gonna it deleted the S bomb node and it deleted all the dependencies and occurrences and everything that came with it. So now if I requery, I guess let's query for it again, all of it, right? There's no S bombs in here at all because I deleted from the database, right? So it's all gone. Um, so and if I ran this dependencies so oh version range is now gone oh that's another thing version range is no longer part of its dependency uh, i think Ridvan, i think you you were asking about this um so that's no longer there and it's now it only points to so the dependent package will always be a version it'll no longer be at the, the name level so that's why version range is no longer required but that's that's another tweak that we made um so if i run this uh this one, then I should see, yeah, there's no dependencies because again, uh, every, I only ingested one S bomb, right? So that's why the database is empty because I deleted everything. Uh, yeah, so if I run, the vulnerabilities should still be, still be there, right? So if I run all, I think query all, yeah, query all, yeah, they're all in there because, right? Because we didn't delete any of the nouns, the nouns are still in there. So if I wanted to delete some of the, one of these vulnerabilities, right? For example, if I could come in, and take this mutation, copy it over here. Just copy it to the top. And let's say I want to delete, All right? This is the top one here. Let's just delete that one. And then I will specify the ID here so that we can query for it again. So now if I requery for it, uh, what's happened? Invalid. Um, why is that? Did I type it in wrong? Oh, I did. I... No, I didn't. Interesting. Okay, not sure why that one is complaining. So, what if I put it here? Invalid type. Interesting. Okay. Not sure what's going on. I'll have to take a look at that. I give it the wrong ID. Anyways, um, so if I delete, I'm not sure if the delete will work. Well, it did work. Okay, so if I re-search for it again, and I don't know why this is giving me an error. I'll have to take a look. I'll have to look into it. Um, but now, yeah, we shouldn't see this specific one show up anymore. If I copy this and if I search for it, yeah, it's not it's not in the list because it's it's gone. All right, um, that is everything. Any questions? Yeah, I thought it was cool to see the vulnerability stuff get ingested at uh, SBOM ingestion time. I think that'll uh, save a lot of like cycles for mm -hmm. getting immediate feedback. I was wondering if the devs.dev stuff could be kind of done at that same time too. So like, Basically, 
filling out the entire dependency tree at the time of S1 ingestion? Is that something that kind of fits in to what we've already done there? Yeah, so it can be done. Um, actually, let me think about it. Yes, I mean, it, it's possible, but again, it's going to add a lot of latency to the ingestion time, right? So if that is a, that's a trade-off you have to make. It's like, how long does ingestion take? And then how, how immediate do you want this information from devs.dev and so forth, right? So devs.dev, it runs as a collector subscriber, right? So it's it's not a, it's not a, it's not waiting on an interval. So these things, right? As a certifier usually waits for like, hey, the next, you know, check again in three hours or whatever it is, right? So if you ingested some S bombs in that three hour cycle in that you know interval, then it's not going to check for vulnerabilities. So that's why it, that's why we thought it was more immediate. Like, hey, I don't want to be waiting for three hours. I want to get that immediate feedback, and then three hours or whatever later, I wanted to recheck again to see if there's new vulnerabilities. For devs.dev, it actually runs as a collector subscriber. Um, so that means that whenever the S bomb gets ingested, it's automatically gets it put it gets put into a queue and all that, you know, all the packages, and it'll they'll be sitting there and it's gonna query devs.dev and pull that information in and 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 push it all into the at ingestion time, basically. So there is no delay in terms of that. So that's the reason why it's not necessary. It's you're gonna get that, you know, right after you ingest the S bomb. I would say you know, depending on the size of the S bomb, right? It should be in a couple of minutes. You'll get all the data from devs.dev kind of thing ingested. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, that's totally fair. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I think that's probably a better, better approach. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's the reason why we have that collector subscriber model there. Basically, it's like, you know, here are some pearls. You know, go find more information about them, kind of thing, right? So you can have other services running in the background that are not blocking ingestion, but at the same time, like adding data in in the background. So by the time you, you know, if you query for it or something, you know, a few minutes later, you should have all the data you need for that specific S bomb to make it, make an analysis or something. Got it. Yeah. And then honestly, then I would also ask it the other way too, then should the vulnerability certifier be like that kind of similar model where it's like collect sub kind of thing? So, yeah, so that's there. Um, that is behaving as, like I said, as a certifier because we wanted to. The collector subscriber only runs once, um, unless it sees the package again, right? Then it's going to recheck. But in the case of the certifier, we wanted to run at an interval because we wanted to keep checking the database to see if there's new vulnerabilities. So the certifier runs it, it in, in, initiates differently. It, the certifier actually uses the graph data, so it, it queries all the packages from the graph and runs a query on that. The collector subscriber is on ingestion time, whatever pearls that it finds, it's gonna use that and, and, and query devs.dev or whatever other service there is. So that's those are the two different things around it. So it's not using it's not using ingestion data, it's actually using graph data, the certifier. Yeah, I mean, I guess fundamentally the data is different because vulnerabilities can change over time versus exactly. uh, dependencies, uh, the tree is, static i would say or or deterministic yeah cool for a specific yeah. for a specific version yes right if a new version comes out then then again devs.dev you can then you'll query devs.dev and pull that information into for you right so next time it comes around cool yeah no that makes sense thanks All right, anything else on this part? Uh, I know Nathan was hoping to be able to show off his end-to-end -end test work, um, but wasn't able to make it today. Um, Parth, can you, or Jeff, or somebody, can you speak to that, or should we bring him back uh, in the August meeting to let him take credit for it? Yeah, I mean, we, we can wait. If Okay. Uh, yeah, that's fine. I think we showed off enough for this week. <laughs> I think there's a lot of good updates. Um, so I think we can we can hold off. All right. Um, so the only other thing on the agenda is just the reminder about uh, the usual upcoming events um, with a link to the OpenSSF calendar. 
uh, for the times and uh, Zoom links, <clears throat> which hopefully will be working. Um, we do have our Guac Time office hours uh, again tomorrow in the EMEA and Eastern America's friendly time zone. Of course, the weekly Guac Maintainer meeting is on Monday, just as it is basically every Monday. Um, and then uh, America's, in particular, West Coast friendly Guac Time office hours will be August 2nd. And our next community meeting will be uh, here on August 15th. Um, so with that, that's the end of the prepared agenda. So does anyone else have cool things to discuss or chat about? I'm hearing a no. So I guess we'll call that done for this week. Um, I apologize that the uh, OpenSSF Zoom link did not work as expected. I've raised that with operations already, um, and they are working on it. Um, so hopefully we'll have a, a good answer for that solved here pretty quickly. Um, but in the meantime, of course, uh, check the YouTube channel for this recording and all of the other meetings. All right. Well, then I will see everybody next month, if not sooner. Take care, everyone. Thank you.